And we have returned with another episode of A Different Perspective, and I truly am Kevin Randall. Today we're doing something special. We have a two-hour uh, block here to use for our discussion with Stephen Bassett, uh, who is the executive director of the Paradigm Research Group, which he founded in 1996 to end the government-imposed embargo on the truth behind UFOs. Uh, Stephen has spoken to audiences around the world about the implications of formal disclosure, which means when the government comes out and tells us what's going on about UFOs and uh, what they mean to the uh, human race, engaging the human race. He has done uh, given over a thousand radio and television interviews and PGR's advocacy work has been extensively covered by national and international media in 2013. PRG produced a citizen hearing on disclosure at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., which I participated in with a number of other people who were uh, well-known in the UFO field and witnesses to various UFO incidents, including the late Jesse Marcel Jr. and um, the, the men, some of the men who were involved in the Bentwaters Rendlesham Forest incident of uh, December 1980. Um, in no, on November 5th, 2014, PRG launched a congressional hearing political initiative seeking the first hearings on Capitol Hill since 1968 regarding extraterrestrial presence. And he is working to see the issues included um, in the various presidential campaigns and senatorial campaigns and other campaigns around the world. Stephen Bassett, an impressive resume. Welcome to A Different Perspective. Mm, impressive, yes, yes. Good to be with you, Kevin. It's the first time that uh, we have ever done an interview together. I well, it's because I haven't had a show uh, prior to that, and uh, yeah, you know, that would explain it. Yes, <laughs> part of it. Uh, when uh, I I did a radio show in El Paso, Texas, in the mid 1990s uh, for 18 months, but. Uh, I don't. I'm, you weren't really involved in UFOs at the time, and the way you are now. So I guess we kind of missed uh, connections then. So this is the first our first opportunity, I guess. And I'm glad because I've done a huge number of interviews. It's so more, more like over 1,200 now. But rarely have I had the opportunity to be interviewed by somebody that has the knowledge base and the expertise that you have, uh, which is an asset. I mean, I'm, I'm not criticizing anyone. Uh, the, the people that uh, uh, have their internet shows and what have you on this subject matter, uh, uh, by and large, very, very, very few of them have what, what, uh, an expertise like you. So this is a good opportunity because obviously it allowed, we can go in, 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 into areas and go deeper than normally would be the case. So glad to be with you. Well, thank you. I appreciate the kind words. Uh, let's do this. Last Wednesday, we were going to we had an interview scheduled, which sort of fell by the wayside. You called me late in the day to talk about some new documents that had just been released, some MJ12 yeah. documents um, that you were very excited about. Can you give me a little bit of the background to that? Yes, of course. Um, it, it came. It, this all developed very quickly. Uh, a, a, an individual provided uh, about 40, a 47 or 48 page document to a talk show host. Uh, in this case, it's uh, uh, Midnight in the Desert. Heather Wade. Which is a show, Heather Wade. And this is a show that's been around a while. It, it was an Art Bell show, and Art sort of retired again. And she took over this slot, 9 to 12, internet. It's, uh, high, you know, the, the, the Dark Matter Radio is a relatively good production, high production values, and um, uh, the show has a following. Uh, and she was provided this document, which she then put up on her website uh, for download. Uh, I learned about it maybe 36 hours, 40 hours after it was up on the web. Well, when you put a document on the web for download as a PDF, you're basically putting it out to the entire world. And it will be downloaded, and it will be in play very quickly. And so I uh, immediately wanted to get involved for reasons we'll discuss. Uh, and uh, I, uh, um, uh, the first thing I did was to contact a number of individuals which I consider to be the best uh, uh, options for checking out a document in this genre. Uh, yourself, 
uh, Richard Dolan, uh, Stanton Friedman, uh, uh, and uh, suggested they look at it right away. Uh, Richard Dolan is in Greece traveling, so he's kind of limited there. Stan was able to look at it. He was on her show last night. Whitley Strieber was also brought in to look at this document. He, he was on the show last night. Linda Moulton Howe has, has now discussed it. Um, and uh, that's what we wanted. Uh, so that's how this came about. And uh, uh, obviously, we'll be talking about this document. Well, not wanting to put you on the spot, but doing it anyway. Uh, what was the reaction of, say, uh, Linda Howe, Stan Friedman, Whitley Strieber? Did they have what would do you know what their reactions were to the document? What they feel about it? I, 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 I don't know all the details because this is you know many hours of uh, a program that went on. Uh, I heard some of Stan talking, but uh, mostly what I, I'm getting is is that this document is serving as a conversation starter, and its result it's uh, in a number of, some of these issues are being talked about. Uh, so, I, I I haven't I can't say what their definitive assessment is yet. I have gotten assessments from other people and I have looked over the document myself uh, and I have concluded that it is a hoax. Uh, and not only that, it, it, well, it, and or it is very poor disinformation. Uh, well, when we when we talked Wednesday, you had, I guess, three possibilities, one that it was a hoax, mm -hmm. uh, one of them that it was authentic and one of it, one of them was it was disinformation. So you're now saying that it's probably a hoax and not disinformation. And, and or disinformation. There's actually four possibilities. Uh, okay. Uh, legitimate, uh, an actual document, the real deal, a hoax, uh, meaning it's simply made up, literally put together for no other purpose than to deceive, or it's disinformation. And there's two kinds of disinformation. One would be something created by the U.S. government, by U.S. government entities of some kind or another, in order to serve a purpose. And the other would be uh, disinformation from a private citizen put together, no government connection at all, uh, because they have an issue or an agenda. Most likely they don't like this subject, they feel it's bogus, and they want to create problems. Uh, so there's those four possibilities. And uh, any one of the uh, th three of them are still in play, but legitimate document is not in play. It's it, in my view. I mean, I you cannot disprove these kinds of things. Uh, it, it's very difficult to absolutely disprove them. Um, and uh, in many cases, hoaxes like this, they, they draw an in information that is valid. It's out there. It's in the public domain. So actually proving it's totally a hoax, difficult to do. But uh, people who are very knowledgeable that have spent years in this field can give you a pretty damn good guesstimate. And my guesstimate is hoax and or poor disinfo. What uh, brought you to that conclusion? There's a number of things. Uh, but I have to say that the, the thing that I, that I find most amusing about it, and this is like eight pages in, um, about eight pages into the document, and they're talking about a history. In this case, it's the history of, um, let me see if I've got this now, hang on a second. Um, Operation Majestic 12 preliminary briefing, and well, it's just part of the history of it. And it goes into the background of Majestic 12, okay. And it, refer it makes a statement here, and I don't know if this is intentional, uh, but it makes a statement that the one of the facilities for Majestic 12 is located under Flat Rock, Nevada. Yes. There is no Flat Rock, Nevada. There is, but there is in fiction a Flat Rock, Nevada, and that is in the movie Andromeda Strain and the book Andromeda Strain by the late, great Michael Critton. So uh, that's, that's an Easter egg. It, it couldn't be more obvious. Uh, and uh, it's amusing. So right there, you got a problem. Uh, as the document in general that has some paragraphs where they're talking about Roswell, Majestic 12, that, uh, that, that read relatively well, but they could easily have been obtained directly from the work of uh, the research in this field. 
and other documents that have emerged in the past. Uh, but there are other paragraphs that are just not impressive at all. They don't they don't have the proper tone. They don't have the proper writing. And then as you get to the and and, and the front end of the document again is 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 much better than the back end. The back end is when they get into this long uh, assessment of uh, outcomes from the Aztec event, which is an event that's been discussed and researched extensively. And in this case, they're trying to add real new material, including an interview with a living entity and the description of the Aztec event. And uh, it is not impressive. Uh, in fact, it seems ridiculous. And um, I, 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 I can't even conceive of that scenario and the interview, and some of the other statements about the Aztec event uh, as having much chance at all of being valid. And well, so I know when you, you put that, to, yeah. When you and I talked, when you and I talked on Wednesday, I had I had scanned the document pretty quickly, and uh, looked at this interview, which was I guess made up of several interviews talking to the extra uh, extraterrestrial biological entity identified as EB, and he said they wanted to know why he came to Earth, and one of the comments was that they like trees. And we, you, and I it, kind, yeah. you, you and I kind of talked about that, and you thought, would, yeah. would someone who's gone to the trouble of hoaxing this document put something that ridiculous in it? And uh, That is a good point. Uh, uh, as, a, uh, as a hoax, that, that, that meaning a good hoax, a quality hoax, you would <laughs> not expect something that ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, There are hoaxes and there are hoaxes. Um, uh, now, I had not read the document at that point. Uh, I was... Uh, primarily, for, well, I'd only just looked a little bit at the front. My, my initial job was to get this document in the hands of people like you, right? And we'll talk about that. Uh, I eventually caught up with the document, went through it. And uh, there's worse stuff than the tree thing. The, 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 the Aztec aliens are supposedly uh, humanoid. Uh, they speak perfect English, etc. Uh, no, they don't, they don't speak perfect English. They speak colloquial English. Uh, and that too, yeah, perfect <laughs> colloquial English. And so, okay, so uh, that that's my position. We obviously agree on that. And so now we get to, okay, but why bother, right? Why do I bother to call you? Why did I bother to call Stan Friedman? Well, there's a reason, very good reason. Uh, and it's this, that disinformation uh, which takes a number of forms. One of the forms that is most commonly known is limited hangout. And the definition of a limited hangout is when a government entity, it usually refers to a government situation, puts out uh, in lieu of, or rather in advance of some very true information coming out, they then put out a document or put out some sort of verbal, could even be video, but usually a document, which has that true information in it, but then has a lot of not true information, either obvious or less obvious, but eventually and uh, it can be determined by researchers. In order to corrupt and deflect from the actual true information, which is coming out often because, and they, which they can't stop. So they call it a limited hangout, but it's basically disinformation. The fundamental role of disinformation is to pollute the swimming pool right? It's to, it's, you know, you got a swimming pool with really nice clear water in it and you start adding, you know, pollution to it, right? Muddy it up uh, in order to make it more and more difficult to, to ascertain truth from fiction and to uh, disrupt what might be research uh, into some area. Disinformation is extremely effective. It's been used by governments for thousands of years, but it has been perfected to an art form since World War II, and it has been used extensively in the extraterrestrial phenomena issue in service to the truth embargo. Uh, and what can I say? Um, I'm not a fan of this. Uh, and it's been going on uh, not, not only, well, but this way. During the Cold War, when the ET issue and its disclosure was viewed by many in government undoubtedly as not in the national security interest. They took, they did a lot of things to keep this thing contained. 
including disinformation and much more. I'm not going to argue that too strongly. Uh, They had, you know, never in history had national security operatives faced a situation as existentially threatening as the as the Cold War. Uh, Thousands of nuclear weapons on instant alert, ready to be launched on a moment's notice from many locations resulting in what would have been essentially the annihilation of human civilization. And so they took measures which I'm not going to argue with too much. However, the Cold War has been over for 26 years, 27 years, and disinformation has continued not only in the area of the ET issue but in other areas, many of which involve war and peace. And it is a technique that needs to be contained, if not eliminated, It is no longer acceptable. It is destructive. It is undermining the American Republic. And so for me, what's important now is when something like this turns up, that it be engaged immediately, it be assessed, and it be, to the extent possible, uh, debunked or confirmed. And it, it was particularly important in the ET area that that process be take place by researchers in this field who are knowledgeable, because if they don't engage it right away, the debunkers, the hyper skeptics and the trolls are going to run with it. They're going to have a lot of fun. They're going to use it to attack the field, attack the issue uh, with no real, uh, real, real serious uh, intent to really arrive at the truth. And and, uh, I want to prevent that. Well, and looking at the document, I the first thing that I noticed is on the front page, the first page, um, which uh, we have there, ultra mm-hmm. top secret. Uh, that kind of bothered me right off the bat because uh, ultra was a specific program during World War II run by the British. So ultra top secret seemed to be a combination of uh, material from the British archives and uh, now the United States. And it also says on it, read and destroy. So where did this copy come from if you're supposed to read it and destroy it? I would think that the person who received the document would obey the instructions rather than keep it on hand. And I know as a um, as an officer who was uh, responsible for classified material and the destruction of the classified material in my office that we would purge the files periodically to get rid of the material that we didn't use, the material that became superfluous or was replaced by later material. So uh, in this case, I would have destroyed this thing after I'd read it, had I had I received it, rather than keep it keep it on. And, th- and the other problem I had with it right off the bat was nobody knew where it came from. We don't know who the source, the original source was. Uh, Heather says she knows who she got it from, but the uh, name of the person who had it originally uh, is is uh, not known to us. I, it may be known to her, but he's deceased, so we can't go back and talk to him. So when we begin looking at the document, the first problem we have with it is its lack of provenance. Where did it come from? What agency originated this document? And apparently it was originated by the um, uh, MJ-12 committee, and that doesn't allow us any type of FOIA requests or any place to go to try to verify the, the document at all. Of course. Uh, and that is uh, one of the great advantages that the government has when it comes to this kind of uh, this area. Uh, when you're operating in deep black, when you have uh, programs uh, in extreme classification status, you you cannot uh, determine those things. All right? So if something does come out, and guess what? Things do come out. The the uh, certainly a, a an American citizen or researcher who doesn't have deep classification status uh, has no way of getting provenance, has no way of cutting to the chase on this. All they can do is compare it to other information and evidence and try to get a sense of whether it's valid or not. Um, well, my and, first reaction, and, my one of my first reactions for reading this was it it, it uh, mimicked the book uh, UFO Crash at Aztec by William Steinman and Wendell Stevens. And it seemed especially the Aztec material was uh, drawn heavily from that uh, book. And 
the other the MJ12 material, the the list of the names and the people and all of that sort of stuff has been well publicized, not only by Stan, but but it's sure. in uh, Steinman's book. It's been you can find it on the internet. It's it's well publicized. So there was nothing new there, and that and that material has never been uh, I, I think vetted to the point where we can say, yeah, this is a, a authentic material. Uh, the Steinman book on Aztec, I'm not familiar with it, but did that did that book describe the Aztec crash as including uh, a humanoid um, ET beings, including children in cryogenic containers? No, it did not include that. Yeah, I didn't think so. So that's kind of, in other words, if you're going to create a hoax and, and you get rolling and you start putting stuff together and you're trying to be cool, yeah, you're going to come up. There's some new things there in the sense that I have not heard them before uh, connected to that subject matter. Uh, but again, not particularly impressive uh, as an attempt to uh, uh, convince us that, yeah, you've got something new that needs to be looked into. Well, the other, the other problem I had looking at the document was the Roswell material. Of course, it's all dated like uh, 01 January 1947 or whatever, it, which was not a dating format that was being used at the time consistently, other than allegedly by the MJ-12 documents. But if you read through the, um, the Rosmo material, it, it doesn't seem that the person who created this hoax had a good idea of what was going on. The, the timings are off. The chronology is off. Um, all these yes. sorts of things. They get the name of the base at Roswell wrong repeatedly. In fact, none of the bases that they mention in this document are, are right. You mentioned Flat Rock, Nevada. Um, I'm looking at the, the, they put Kirtland Air Force Base in Texas, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got various names for the Roswell Base. They, they get it wrong when it was both the Roswell Army Airfield and then uh, Walker Air Force Base. They get all that material wrong. Uh, so there's all these, these things that if this was a document created at the high level, it would have allegedly been created at, they would have had access to that information and understood exactly what it was and how these things should be um, mm -hmm reported in this sort of a document. You know, you just don't get those things wrong. You might, in a draft form of document, put this, put uh, the Roswell Air Force Base, whatever the heck is it, uh, that sort of thing. But by the time you get to the point yeah. where you're publishing it, you're going to have the name of the base right. Uh, the other thing that bothered me, that leapt out at me immediately, was it said that Twining had gone to Roswell and leave Colonel, relieved Colonel Blanchard of his command. Had that event taken place, we would have known it because there would have been a lot of documentation if Blanchard had, in fact, been relieved. And yeah. I said in an analysis that I had done that Twining, as a th uh, three-star general at the time, he would have been the senior officer and certainly could have taken command for this specific incident, being he outranked Blanchard heavily, but he certainly didn't relieve him of command. So that sort of thing, this lack of understanding of the way the military operates, the military timing and that sort of thing sort of permeates the document as well and suggests that it, uh, it's not disinformation. Uh, because I think if it was different information, there would be a... Um, there would be a, a poison pill or two poison pills in there. It wouldn't be loaded with all the, the problems that this document has. Uh, I agree. And, but there's several points here that uh, I should, we went, you need to look at. Well, first of all, let me say this. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, all, it's all, I feel a little awkward that you're having to waste any time on it. Uh, it's almost like a master chess, uh, uh, you know, grandmaster chess champion having being forced to play a, a uh, you know, a, a novice chess player. Uh, it's almost a waste of time. It's too easy. Uh, and uh, but that said, the document does exist. Somebody created this. And I think it's not something you could put together in a couple of days. Uh, this would have taken some effort. Uh, and I suppose if, if you really worked at it, you might get it done in two or three or four weeks. Somebody created this now, either recently or years ago. Uh, right? We're going to we're going to have to take a break here. I see we're running, we're running short on time. I've got some analysis up at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com, and we will return turn, <laughs> return shortly after this with Steve Bassett talking about the latest MJ-12 document. Don't go away.
And I am back with Stephen Bassett. We're talking about the new MJ-12 documents. Uh, Stephen Bassett's, I can't believe it, I hid his, his uh, website. Steve, what's your, what's your website for the people who might want to take a look at what you have there? Paradigm Research Group. Dot org. Okay. And I mean, if, if you're if you want to be successful in the 21st century, you got to learn how to spell paradigm. It's going to be a big paradigmatic century. <laughs> Paradigmresearchgroup.org. And I think I think spell check will take care of that for you. Absolutely. If, if you can get close to it, <laughs> uh, which sometimes sure. is really hard to do in in the book or in the uh, on the uh, spell checks. Uh, when we went away, we were talking about the um, MJ-12 documents that were just released and the reasons uh, that we seem to think that they're a hoax. And I was mentioning that I had looked at the Roswell material very, very carefully and that I found, you know, the base being spelled wrong. I found that the uh, White Sands Missile Range uh, is misidentified. Um, I found the chronology to be completely wrong. And if you had not... If you'd read my book, Roswell in the 21st Century, you would have seen the proper chronology as it had been published in a newspaper. I think it's the, um, um, the Illini, which was, I think is the student newspaper at the University of Illinois. But they had a chronology of the events that took place on December, uh, January, uh, good Lord, July 8th uh, of 1947 when the story broke about the Roswell UFO crash and how everything played out based on, uh, on that. So you look at the chronology of that, which was created at the time of the event, and you take a look at this document here, and the chronology is completely off. It's got Brazel apparently calling the sheriff um, at 5 o'clock in the morning. But Jesse Marcel says, well, he got the call from the sheriff while he was eating lunch, so that suggests around noontime. And I don't know exactly what the lunch schedule was at Roswell in 1947, but in my military experience, they usually stagger that, that uh, you would be eating lunch as early as 11 o'clock in the morning and as late as uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, but certainly not 5 o'clock in the morning. So that suggested that the person who was creating the document really hadn't paid close attention to what's going on uh, to that. And I, that I don't understand because it's so easily checked. You know, some of the other things are more obscure that take a longer time to check. And, you know, if we were 25 years ago, it'd be impossible to check some of this stuff. Now you go on the Internet and just type the thing in and you get a whole long list of the, of the material. But then you, you you couldn't do that 25 years ago. So that bothered me about the document um, from the beginning as I began to take a look at it. When you and I first talked about it, um, I had just scanned it. And I, like I said, I mentioned that the... Uh, the aliens liked the trees that we had, and I'd put in in a in a posting. I wondered if they still like strawberry ice cream and Tibetan music, which came out in the uh, UFO cover up live. Uh, when was that? Uh, 25, 30 years ago. Uh, Bill Moore and everybody talking about the uh, the Roswell crash. Uh, so so that's those sorts of things bothered me immensely. Um, I had asked you about um, listening to Stan last night on uh, Midnight in the Desert. And as you pointed out, he did go through the chronology of MJ-12 at length before we get to these documents. And he seemed to take somewhat of a neutral stand, saying we need to take a chance to look at him. But I think you and I have, are, are kind of on the same page here, that, that we've had an opportunity to look at this stuff. And it's clearly nothing that is authentic. It's, it's clearly a hoax. It's not disinformation. It was put together by someone who has a rudimentary um, knowledge of, of the UFO field, but doesn't really understand it in depth. Is that the impression you got? Uh, yeah. Uh, one of the things that I'd comment here is that uh, y y as you were going through some of the Roswell information, and we're talking about the times for a lunch or uh, some of these minutia, what, what uh, government and hoaxers need to understand now is that the amount of research that's been done, the, the people that have spent years doing this, we have a lot of knowledge about what has taken place. And you try to pull this stuff, you try to pop this stuff out, and, and we can pretty much uh, tear it apart down to its uh, uh, molecular level almost. Uh, maybe not everything, but enough that we're gonna figure out pretty quickly that it's not, uh, not legit. Um, so, that's one message that I want definitely to get out and be repeated uh, uh, to those that want to continue to play this game. Now, another point. 
uh, your audience needs to uh, maybe understand some of the terminology. I, a, a disinformation is basically a hoax, and a hoax is basically disinformation. What the difference is is intent, and oftentimes quality. Um, disinformation at the government level is very sophisticated. Uh, most people that do hoaxes can ne never would go that far. The amount of work that's involved. But so uh, th there is that. But let's now step back. I want to, to look at the bigger picture on this because there is a bigger picture. Uh, so here is what we know. One, a known individual, name withheld at this point, sent this document to a television talk show host, knowing that they would then be published almost certainly. This individual has a friend who was the source of the document, meaning he's the one that got it, gave it to him. That person is known to, to Heather Wade. All right? Okay. We don't know who created this document, and we don't know when it was created. We do know when it was delivered to Heather Wade. Okay? The document is crude in many ways. It is obviously, in my view, a hoax. Uh, it's not that hard to figure it out, all right? And then there's the timing. Is there a, any reason to, to wonder why the, this thing would turn up right now as opposed to, well, any other time? There are some reasons for that. Um, of late, there's been some significant developments. And let's just go back over the last year. Let's just go back over, well, actually going back about a year and a half. Very quickly, over the last year and a half, we had a significant development in the presidential campaign in which the, uh, the, the, the leading candidate, Secretary Hillary Clinton, and her husband and her campaign manager were forced under substantial media pressure to speak to the extraterrestrial issue on 12 separate occasions, on interviews as well as um, on television uh, interviews as well as print interviews, creating quite a bit of a story almost 500 articles easily in the mainstream media. And this went on for about 11 months until they stopped talking about the subject on June the 2nd. It almost became a major story. I mean, blown, blown sky high. But the failure of the television uh, news host moderators of all the debates in the presidential election to ask a single question about it kind of settled it down. Uh, it would have reemerged re in a big way. Uh, had she won the election, but she did not. And so there was that. Uh, in addition, um, I received a contact right after the election uh, that uh, came to me under encrypted uh, text under signal uh, by someone inside that I sort of know who it is, basically saying that uh, letting, uh, I guess, me know, knowing that I would pass it on, that there were people inside the Pentagon prepared to cooperate with the Secretary of Defense if the Secretary of Defense were to reach down to them regarding the ET issue. And the reason given for this, how would you say, text, was that these individuals, whoever they were, well, maybe this way, that the individuals that this contact was referring to had a preference for disclosure taking place under Obama as opposed to the president who was about to take over 70 days from that point. Nothing came from that. Uh, nothing developed during that 70 days other than the Trump circus got really going. Then two days before the inauguration, the CIA, for in, in a remarkable timing in my view, suddenly announces that 13 and a half million pages from 900,000 documents about the history of the CAA with a lot of references to ET issues, UFO, psychic research, which had been declassified and available on uh, by, via the, the servers at the National Archives, if you could get there, were now going to be put on the web for everybody to see, meaning you can get to them. Everybody can find them, 13 and a half million. That, that hit the news two days before the inauguration, which I found interesting, to say the least. Um, a couple months after I uh, after the election, I went to London, where I met with uh, a contact there that informed me that members of the MOD, the Ministry of Defense in the UK, were very much uh, inclined toward disclosure and interested in seeing that develop, though there obviously were certain limitations. Fine. 
Uh, and then, just a few weeks ago, uh, in a remarkable interview with Robert Bigelow, the billionaire space entrepreneur who has been a NASA contractor since 2001, uh, knowing that he would be asked about this subject, because these, these usually the genre that's going to be discussed is, is provided in advance to the, to the subject. Uh, when you do an interview like this, and this is CBS 60 Minutes, he wouldn't have known the specific question, nor would CBS have known the specific answer. But very appropriately, uh, Robert Bigelow was asked about his interest in the subject of extraterrestrials. And he gave an, a startling answer, which caught the interviewer. I think her name is Laura Hogan by surprise. She Laura Logan. Laura, 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 Laura Logan. Lo Laura yes. Logan. Laura Logan. Laura Logan. Yes. Basically, what Robert Bigelow did was say that one, he had spent millions of dollars researching the subject, which very few people can say, and that the extraterrestrial presence was absolute reality. And then there was this special moment when Laura uh, gave the standard, what I'll call truth embargo response, namely, you know, Mr. Bigelow, are you, aren't you concerned? I'm paraphrasing that there, some people might hear this and think you're crazy, to which he instantly responded, I don't give a damn. And then when you, she you, followed me, up, he me, said, me, I don't care. Let me let me break in here because I had an opportunity to interview uh, James Van Allen, the radiation belt guy. Uh, he was the um, chairman of the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Iowa. I took an astronomy course uh, at the university, so I can say I studied astronomy under Van Allen. He just happened to be the president of the, or the chairman of the department. Um, but I had an opportunity to interview him for a magazine article. And I asked him, it was specifically about UFOs and that sort of thing. And I asked him about that. And uh, he was saying, if you're in the middle of the Wyoming and you hear the thunder of hoofbeats, you don't expect zebra. But you have to look. <laughs> sure. The, the, but the, 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 the sidebar to this was, a couple of decades later, I saw a story on the news about a zebra who'd escaped and was running around loose in Wyoming. So you could hear the thunder of hoofbeats in Wyoming, and it would, in fact, be zebra as opposed to horses, which suggests, you know, anything is possible. But I, I, his attitude about this, because I asked him the same question, you know, aren't you worried about what your colleagues are going to say? I mean, this is James Van Allen. The only place you don't call it the Van Allen belts is the University of Iowa. There, they're just the radiation belts, because the Van Allen belt, according to him, is what he uses to hold up his pants. He was ah. funny. He was a funny guy. Funny uh, guy. But he he didn't care. He had a, he had his place in history. He was um, yeah. well respected throughout the astronomical community, uh, so he could say these sorts of things and not worry about repercussions. And I think Bigelow is kind of in the same place. I don't care what these people say. This is what my attitude is, and this is what I have learned in my investigations or my research or m in passing about UFOs. Well, there's a, but let me elaborate on that. There's, a, there's, a, there's an equation here that's been very, very consistent throughout the truth embargo going back to the 40s. Uh, the higher up the food chain you are, the more, the more, wealth, the, the more wealthy you are, uh, the, more, uh, the higher level position you have, rank, station, uh, the less likely you are able to speak or will speak to this issue. Uh, it is people that are well down uh, that ladder uh, who will speak candidly about it. Uh, there are some witnesses of late that have come forward, very important ones, but they're usually retired military. They're not wealthy. They don't have a, a, a public persona, uh, uh, and they have spoken to it. It comes. It's the old. It's the old Bob Dylan line: "If you ain't got nothing, you got nothing to lose." Now. I'm going to be frank about this. You know, the, there are a lot of very important, wealthy, and uh, significant individuals in this country who I'm quite convinced know there's an extraterrestrial presence. Not only because the evidence has been in the public domain for 70 years, you don't have to have special access, but they have contacts that you and I would only dream to have. So whether you're talking about a Steven Spielberg or a George Lucas or a James Cameron or a Jeff Bezos or uh, 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 Richard Branson, or a Robert Bigelow, uh, I'm quite convinced they know it's an extraterrestrial presence, but they don't talk about it. They certainly don't acknowledge it, and they do not support the advocacy movement, 
which is to say they do not challenge the government on this issue. That is the way that equation works. And so when Bigelow makes that statement, he broke rank there. All right. He did something Carl Sagan wouldn't do. Right. Or uh, Freeman Dyson wouldn't do or Michio Kaku wouldn't do. He basically said, I don't give a damn. There is an extraterrestrial presence. I know it. And uh, anything anybody else says doesn't alter that reality. Now, understand that this is a man who for 16 years has had to work with NASA in order to pursue his dream of uh, advanced uh, um, um, off-Earth habitats. He spent $300 million doing this work. And if NASA doesn't cooperate with him, uh, not much can come of it. He's very limited. And the reason that CBS uh, was interviewing him at all was that one of his, for the very first time, one of his space habitats, uh, an inflatable structure, was in fact for the first time attached to the International Space Station where it was inflated and was functioning. And so this was kind of like a, 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 a supreme moment for Robert Bigelow uh, where 15 years of work was showing great promise. And even with that, uh, that habitat attached to the, the space station and all that that meant, when asked the ET question, he, which he could have easily dodged, he took it on directly. That was intentional. That was Bob Bigelow basically saying, damn it, I am so frustrated with this lie, this misrepresentation, this truth embargo in its 70th year that I'm going to say something. And I believe when he said that statement, I don't give a damn, that was a message to all of the other big shots, uh, the, the, uh, the Elon Musk, the Bransons, the Bezos, the big Hollywood producers like Spielberg and others who damn well know there's an extraterrestrial presence. Why don't you grow a pair and speak some truth to power like I just did? Uh, well, you, and so you, that, that was a well, significant you, moment. You've moved us from the Sam J-12 document, which I think you are suggesting could be disinformation simply because of the timing of it as kind of a way of deflecting the statements that Bigelow said, or it might be because it's the 70th anniversary of the Roswell I was events. about to say that. Roswell's <laughs> coming up in 30 days, and, and, yeah, the, and it's the 70th anniversary. They anticipate 50,000 people being there. You know that's going to put the issue back into play, stick in the media. And so we have this document that is released, and I'm, I, I don't think that a government – um, resource would think that we would fall for it. When I say we, I, I, I'm talking about the people who are knowledgeable about the Roswell case. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking Don Schmidt, uh, Tom Carey, Stan Friedman, although Stan oh. hasn't hasn't mentioned anything about it, but would look at this document and see um, the holes in it. Uh, it. It doesn't it doesn't do the job of disinformation. It doesn't divert attention to. Uh, oh, but does not necessarily, uh, Kevin. Just because we see the holes in it, the general public. Look, if we've learned anything over the last couple of years, is the general public has become extremely susceptible to, to propaganda. Uh, and they, they talk about a post-truth world, a post-fact world. Th those are not trivial statements. The public right now is more vulnerable to BS propaganda and nonsense than ever before, even though you and I are not so vulnerable. And that includes a great deal of the media. And so it is not out of the question that this ludicrous document was put out there uh, and, and, and as ludicrous as it is, because they knew a significant portion of the media and the general public would gag on it, and a lot of less informed people would jump on it and say, oh, look at this, it's real, and the whole thing would be just another giant embarrassment for this issue, which is starting to make certain, certain people uh, nervous. Now, I don't know that for a fact, but I'm trying to at least give the framework for people that are trying to assess this. Is well, let's, that let's there may back, be more than meets the eye. Let's go back to May of uh, 2015 and the Roswell Slides fiasco. Is that part of a disinformation campaign or is that something separate where two guys found these slides and believed that they could convince people that it was an alien creature for their own um, self-aggrandizement, for their own monetary gain, as opposed to something to uh, create a uh, situation where people are now again laughing at the idea of extraterrestrial visitation? I can only give you my opinion on that. Uh, I have some knowledge about that entire event. 
Uh, my view is it was a colossal mistake. In other words, it was a screw up. Uh, and, a screw uh, up by who? By a number of people. Uh, in other words, the people involved, by and large, the principals, uh, really made a mistake. Now, I, I think it, the, the, the nature of the mistake is this. One, I think they got excited. They, got, they hyperventilated. They got a little worked up about the possibilities. And, and one of the reasons that that often happens is that this truth embargo has gone on so long. The frustration levels are enormous. Everybody wants this to end. Anything turns up, they tend to jump on it uh, very quickly. Um, and then because of the people involved, there was a potential for a very substantial monetary gain without question. And a lot of money was made. And I think the combination of those two things blinded some of the people who I, I, I don't think are bad people. And I, and I think, uh, and, and, and I, I, and I'm, I'm not publicly trying to condemn them and I'm not even using their name. The point is that it kind of blinded them to the fact that we need to think about this a little more carefully. We need to make sure what we've got. And the end result was a fiasco. And a lot of people said, oh, it's the end of the uh, Roswell issue and so forth. But no, no, it wasn't. The Roswell reality survived that mess. Uh, the field survived that mess, and by and large, uh, after a number of apologies were issued, not by everyone, uh, we've moved on. And the reason for that is simple. There is an extraterrestrial presence. There's a vast amount of evidence for it. And there's new witnesses coming forward. There's new information being gathered all the time. And of course, sightings continue unabated and in some cases even record highs. And so somebody screwing up on a particular piece of evidence and maybe even making money for it is not going to bring down the field. But the uh, question the question is, was it yeah. part of a disinformation campaign? Or I don't was think so. It, it, so it was merely... Um, people attempting to make a financial gain because they happened across these these two slides. Not I, just a financial. I'm, not, say, not, just, I'm not, just, not saying the UFO people, but the guys who had the slides in the beginning. I I don't know. I I I, I don't. I think that this thing developed over time, and it became clear. It became possible at some point for this to become a significant event. Uh, and so, uh, if you're going to have a significant event. And you can pull an audience in and make a good deal of money. You would do that. Uh, the people involved, t to me, what I know about them is, no, this is not a government-backed disinformation uh, attempt. Um, but I could be wrong. But I'm just giving you my opinion. Well, let's hold um, let's hold that thought for a minute because we're going to yeah. have to take another short break here because uh, we're we're running out of time. But we're talking with Steve Bassett of the. Uh, uh, Paradigm Research Group, and he's an advocate of disclosure, an advocate of telling people what's going on in the UFO field. You can take a look at his uh, website at paradigmsearchgroup.org. Researchgroup.org. Group. Research I'm sorry, it's hard to read when it's all scrunched together like that. And uh, you can learn more about this at my blog at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And we will be back right after this, so please stick around. And we are back. I'm with Stephen Bassett. He of the Paradigm Research Organization. We were talking a little bit about disclosure. We'll get into more of that in a moment. We were also talking about the Roswell slides. And as we went away, I think that he and I had pretty much agreed that uh, most of the ufological people involved in this were caught up in their own enthusiasm for the Roswell case and for the extraterrestrial hypothesis. And I don't think there was anything malicious in what they were attempting to do. They were attempting to find out what was going going on, but they allowed their enthusiasm to cloud their vision. So they didn't see the red flags that seemed obvious to, to many of us on the outside of that thing. And I think that the uh, idea from the guys who had the slides was to uh, produce a documentary about how gullible UFO people could be. And that may have gotten sidelined by as quickly as it once the uh, slides were available publicly that 
the placard was decoded and we understood exactly what was going on. So I, th I think that for the most part, I think Steve agrees with me on this, that it wasn't anything malicious by the people in the UFO community. And it may, may be seen as not really malicious as by the people who were owning the slides in the beginning is simply uh, their way of producing a documentary. But it really has nothing to do with government disinformation or anything like that. Is that is that kind of your analysis too, Steve? It's not really government disinformation? No, this wasn't a government disinformation uh, uh, incident. But there's a lot of things we can take away from it. Uh, one, that uh, how quickly the uh, core aspect of that particular um, thread was uh, taken apart on the internet and by and large by researchers in this field uh, uh, they didn't they uh, they immediately saw the problem and and, and of course now uh, information could be moved around in days even even hours and so well, that let me, that's let me, uh, let, that's let me interrupt. A, that's a, yeah. Let me interrupt here because I just wanted to say one thing. What was interesting about this is, is the placard in front of the, the, the creature was decoded and seen. And within a couple of days, researchers has actually found the scientific papers about the recovery of the mummy in uh, yeah. southern right. New Mexico or, or southern Colorado, northern New Mexico, uh, and, and proving it's exactly what it was. So I think that, you know, that's important that the use of the internet and the use of uh, the availability of information yeah. allowed us to resolve that as quickly as we could once we all got copies of a good quality scan of the, of the uh, slides. Yeah. Well, there's a lesson here and, and we're seeing this lesson repeated over and over again. We're living in a new age. Uh, we're living in the age of the internet, high quality software, uh, laptop computers and so forth. So whether you're the government or whether you're a private citizen or organization, you want to try to pull a, either pull a fast one, or if you make a mistake, you will you will get uh, you will find that uh, it is outed uh, very very quickly, uh, and so you have to expect that. Um, again, when citizens and private citizens make mistakes like this, I note it. You'd prefer that they didn't do that, but it happens. When the government pulls stuff like this, that's a different matter. All right, I take it much more seriously. Uh, there's another point I want to make here, is that uh, it's often brought up about how people in this field can be gullible or the research is of lower quality or uh, they're, they're, they're overzealous and what have you. Uh, and there's a, you know, naturally a tendency to try to criticize. Uh, let me frame that. The problem with this issue and its resolution is not the gullibility of researchers or people that care about this subject matter. The problem is the United States government, which has embargoed and contained, misrepresented, undermined, and subverted this issue for 70 years uh, and had huge resources at its disposable to do so. Uh, that's where the problem is. And, and, and I invite people to put more emphasis there. Target their concern, their irritation, their frustration, not at the people in this field that are trying to do what they do, but at the United States government's policy. Um, well, I think it's important. I think it's important to point out here, just to kind of underscore it, is that the majority of the hoaxes that have been foisted on the UFO community have been exposed by members of the UFO community. It's exactly. not really the skeptics or the debunkers or anybody else doing it. It's it's those of us inside looking at the material carefully, like this latest document, and basically picking it apart because we have the in-depth knowledge to do so. Um, th you, you look at some of these things and you know immediately that the skeptical community is going to reject it uh, without really an, an analysis of it to some extent. But you also know the skeptical community is going to look at it. Uh, some of them are going to look at it very, very carefully so that they can they can provide a well-reasoned argument about it. So it, it, it kind of drives us to make sure that when we get something like this, that we do the due diligence in researching it as well. Um, and I think that uh, you know, we look at Heather Wade, who put the material up on her, on her website immediately uh, for all of us to see and decide whether or not that is something real and authentic and something that we should be going forward with. Yeah, it gets complicated. Um, uh, you know, by the way, a quick point, some of the classic debunkers 
when you look back at the history of what they have done and said, what you discover is that on a number of occasions they have screamed hoax. And it turns out that what they were attacking was, in fact, real. Uh, and so uh, the legitimate skeptics and the people in this field, we, we don't want hoaxes. We want to resolve them as quickly as possible. Uh, and uh, that is the way it should be. All right. Nevertheless, we still are operating under a truth embargo in which the, the government denies the, the fundamental existence of the issue itself. And that creates a very extraordinary situation which has, which, uh, under which we labor. There's not much we can do about that, uh, except to try to be understanding and certainly tolerant of the people in the field that are doing what they can do and intolerant toward the government's policy. My job is to end that truth embargo. So it's, it's very clear for me. My job is not to, uh, how would you say, uh, sort out, parse, prove, uh, every aspect of this field and the people in it and all that. No, uh, my job is to end the government policy on embargo, which will ultimately lead to a resolution of most of the uh, uh, uncertainties within the core issue. And then the last thing, I, the other thing I want to make a point, and then I'll get to what Heather is. Uh, there is a history to the ET issue, and it has thousands and thousands of moving parts. And some of those are better uh, understood than others. And there's debates going on amongst those those components. But the core issue is, are there extraterrestrials here? That has been proven. That's a fact. It's been established beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, even though parts of the proof can be debated, the overall assessment to me is fact. Uh, and, I, and, that, and I invite people to always keep that in mind. Uh, when when someone is arguing about some aspect of the Roswell case, that is not about proving whether extraterrestrials are here or not. That is about examining the history. It's like the it's like one of the most uh, written about uh, historical events in American history is the Civil War. There's been something like fifty thousand books about the Civil War, and there are people that will that are intensely involved in that issue and that history that will debate until their dying day certain aspects of the of the history of the Civil War, and they have these feuds that go on. But none of the people that are debating that or writing books about it. Uh, don't deny that there was a civil war. Oh, there was, right? That's a fact. Same thing with the ET issue. Now, well, let me well, let me ask you a question. Let me ask a question here because you keep saying it's a fact that they're here. What case would you point to that suggests, uh, or or uh, several cases that you would point to that say are indisputable fact proof proof that ET area is here? We have alien visitation. That's not the way it works, Kevin. Uh, Let's, the best analogy that I can give you is let's talk about a very complicated trial. And, and I'm going to, and it's somewhat ironic, but I'm going to use the O.J. Simpson case in this particular uh, analogy. Uh, it's comp complicated because in the case of the O.J. Simpson case, the jury did something called jury nullification, where they almost certainly probably knew that he was guilty, but for other reasons decided they were going to say not guilty. Uh, but there are very few people left in this country that do not know that O.J. Simpson was guilty of that murder. OK, so let's talk about that trial, which which uh, briefly, which I watched at great length. And I know many of your listeners or viewers have watched. There is even in a case like that, no such thing as a smoking gun. Uh, smoking guns are very rare and people need to not depend upon them. You, you can have a photograph of somebody holding a gun, pointing at the, the victim that was killed, and that could be faked, right? Or it could be misrepresenting. Yeah, they were pointing a gun, but then they put it down and somebody came in and picked it up and shot the person. You can have four people that come forward and say, this person told me they killed that individual, and they're all lying for various reasons. And we can go on. There isn't a single piece of evidence that can't be theoretically debunked or uh, a, an alternative explanation provided for it. And, and that's the way the law works, and that's the way science works. All right. Guilt, guilt in a case like the O.J. Simpson case is always based upon the collective evidence, the totality of the evidence which creates beyond the reasonable doubt. And that is absolutely the case with the extraterrestrial issue.
There is no single case. There is no single piece of evidence that proves beyond any reasonable doubt that there's an extraterrestrial presence. But the totality of the evidence does. And the totality of the evidence is very substantial. It has been accumulating for 70 years. It is huge. Alan, J. Allen Howling had a wonderful phrase that he often used because back then he was more so than now, I think, asked the question, well, Dr. Heinick, um, where is the evidence for the extraterrestrial presence? And his response is, where do you want me to back up the truck? All right. So I, I'm not going to not answer your question, Kevin. I'm going to – I am going to answer it, and here's what I'm going to say. The – if you want to uh, – if you are somebody on the fence and you want to make an effort to achieve uh, beyond reasonable doubt on the extraterrestrial presence, these are the things that you would look at at some depth. Uh, first of all, you would pay great attention to the witness testimonies that have been emerging since 1991. There have been hundreds of witness testimonies. You would focus on intelligence officers, army officers, air force officers, SAC base officers, and so forth, whose credibility simply should not be uh, questioned and listen to what they're saying. That includes astronauts like Mitchell and Gordon Cooper, Brian O'Leary, and so forth. You would look at the pilot sightings. Uh, the pilot sightings database, which was accumulated by Dr. Richard Haynes at NASA and a afterwards while he was working at NASA and then later. And the reason that that database kind of came into being is that the both the United States Air Force and shortly thereafter commercial airlines made it clear to their pilots that they were not to publicly talk about these, this phenomena and what they may see while in the air. And should they do that, they could lose their flight privileges. As a result, uh, after that, uh, what all, many of these pilots did was, since they couldn't talk publicly, they would they would approach Richard Haynes and say, "Look, uh, here's what I saw. Please put it in the the database. Put it in there for the record." And uh, this database of pilot sightings, uh, which is in the thousands, it's over well over three thousand, is one of the most important pieces of evidence in the world. All right. And then you have to examine the government documents that have been obtained and have been established as being legitimate. Right. You do need to look, you would then review the research on some of the most important cases, the extensive research into Roswell, Rendlesham Forest and so forth. Uh, that certainly would be significant. And then if you really want to go deep, you need to look at the contact evidence. The contact evidence, which is not essential to the ending the truth embargo or to proving the ET presence simply cannot be ignored. It is extraordinarily large. Uh, it took 30 years for that to happen. But when the contact evidence started emerging in depth uh, in the late 80s, by the uh, end of the, two, uh, that, that 20th century uh, and, 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 and further, the number of reports that have been submitted in writing by individuals, private individuals, about their contact with extraterrestrials is now well over a half a million. When you, say, report, uh, when you say contact with extraterrestrials, are you talking specifically about just contact or are you talking about abductions? I'm talking about contact, uh, most of which is physical. Most of the accounts that have been reported are physical contact. Some of them are psychic contact. Some of the physical contact could be and, and is often ascribed by the individual as an abduction event. Uh, but whether it's an abduction or whether it's um, consensual doesn't matter. It's physical contact with extraterrestrials. It's a half a million reports or more that have accumulated in the research files. And these individuals have no expectation for fame, no expectation for money. And when they are looked at and reviewed to the extent that they have been – and they needed to be reviewed more extensively, but this is an extremely expensive process. Uh, there is a consistency of evidence uh, or a consistency of reports there that simply cannot be denied. But when you isn't, take that, all isn't, of that isn't that consistency of reports really a, rely a reliance on the uh, researchers who are gathering the data who are well aware of what other people have said about it? So when they are questioning the people about their contact experience, they know what answers they're looking for. And we can see looking at the uh, 
this material, we can see where oftentimes the subject, the witness, is led to a specific point. And uh, John Mack pointed this out by saying he was astounded by the fact that those uh, abductees, those experiencers, those people who have contacted it, um, sort of drift toward a researcher with a specific idea. Those with an Eastern philosophy ended up with him. Those with a uh, sort of a scientific philosophy ended up with uh, Bud Hopkins. And those who were talking about hybrids and some kind of uh, alien invasion ended up with um, uh, David, David Jacobs. Uh, a matching of the experience with the researcher looking for that specific experience. I flip the question and say, can it not be that the researcher is looking for that specific experience and is unconsciously um, suggesting to the person the direction uh, he wants that research to go? Well, the answer to that is that uh, the point you're making is relevant to research, the actual, what we'll call research and engagement of researchers with these individuals, and we're familiar with that, but, uh, uh, most of those half a million plus counts that I'm referring to were submitted unsolicited. Yes, but there's there no research. Uh, they, but they'll end up with some some researcher at some point to get the. Uh, you have to go to somewhere to make that report. But wait a minute. What, what I'm trying to say is, is that if you were to take the time to review the un the, the, the hundreds of thousands of unsolicited unsolic reports from these individuals, you don't have to be a researcher or even interpret much to know that they're talking about physical contact with extraterrestrials, all right? Uh, and so, you know, if you have 10 of those, one could say, well, uh, maybe this 10 reports are uh, an example of some misunderstanding. When you got a couple of hundred thousand, no. So one, the point I'm trying to make, Kevin, is that the evidence is massive. And so if someone wants to uh, achieve a, a reasonable doubt status uh, one way or the other, they need to review the entire evidence. In other words, they can't just they can't just look at five minutes of the O.J. Simpson trial and say he's guilty or innocent. They have to review the entire what was it, seven, eight week trial. And when you do that, he's as guilty as hell. And when you review the evidence, the massive full content of the evidence in the extraterrestrial presence, it's it's fact. It's that simple. But there's also an awful lot of misinterpretation included in that fact. And I think specifically of the Child's Witted case, because it's a, a great example. Here were the two airline pilots who saw a cigar-shaped craft, the square windows zipped by their airliner in 1948. And then we move forward to um, 1968 with the Zon 4 reentry. And we have people who are describing the same sort of thing. Uh, the cigar-shaped craft with square windows on it, but we know what the, the source of that sighting was, which is the re-entry of Zon 4. It was a sort of a natural phenomenon. And so if you uh, look at the uh, just the airline's uh, or the pilot's sightings and you don't understand more about what's going on, then you're going to be drawn into this thing thinking, well, here is very good evidence and some of it isn't all that great. I'm going to have to disagree with you there. It, 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 if a thousand people accuse you of murdering your wife and uh, one of them happens to be mentally ill and the uh, and the defense attorney says, look, you know, yeah, 999 people have accused this man of murdering his wife, but this one person that accused him is mentally ill, therefore the other 990 go out the door. Those, some, no, some of those I'm, saying, I'm saying I'm saying that some of the cases that are accepted as – important of, of extraterrestrial visitation. And uh, the, the child's witted case is one of the very, one of the ones that's inspired the estimate of the situation. They thought it was a very, very credible case. I'm saying in this one specific incident, yes, I think we can draw uh, a conclusion based on evidence that was ex um, gathered much, much later, but it's not the only case of a bolide or a reentry sparking a, um, a UFO sighting. And I think that, you know, you're, you're saying, well, we have all this evidence. And I'm saying, yeah, we've got a lot of evidence, but we have to examine it carefully with this idea. And just saying we have evidence doesn't mean we get to that conclusion no. of alien visitation. That, that look, the, uh, we have evidence that's accumulated for 70 years, all right? Uh, and some of it is, uh, some of the evidence that's been put forward probably was incorrect. Uh, that happens in actual trials, too. 
you can have a trial and there could be some evidence in there that is in fact not correct but the rest of the evidence is sufficient to achieve re uh, beyond reasonable doubt and you get convicted there's 30 there's 3 to 4000 pilot sightings kevin and some of these sightings are disc outside the cockpit window of the pilot seen by the pilot and a co-pilot passengers in the plane maneuvering around the plane and then exiting at rapid speed that's not a bolide and so if you if you want to go and review all of the thousands of pilot sightings in the in the Richard Haynes database and if you can debunk say 95% of them maybe that database is not useful but i'm afraid you couldn't do that no one could do that the you know again it, it, this is the way the truth embargo works you know it's like eight you know sac base officers come forward and discuss how the missiles were turned off and then somebody will find a staff sergeant that said something a little different and that negates the rest of the testimony that's not the way evidence works it's not the way science works however it is the way the truth embargo works Right. The U.S. government and the debunkers play this game. They come up with every possible way to make black seem white, uh, up seem down. They violate the rules of logic and science and evidence in order to keep this truth embargo going. And all I can say is, is that I am a, someone that doesn't put up with that anymore. I, this isn't 1950 or 60 or 70. This is 2017, and the evidence is massive and overwhelming. And I will state that. And somebody can find this case and that case and that problem. I do not care. Unless they can debunk the entire 70 years of evidence, doesn't work. All we need is one extraterrestrial in a craft or not in a craft, and you have an extraterrestrial presence confirmed, right? You don't need to have 10,000. You don't need to have massive ships necessarily moving around in the sky. You just need one. And the evidence for one, well, what can I say? And let me tell you something else. It wasn't that long ago that the debunkers and the skeptics were making a huge deal of the fact that science was saying that life is incredibly rare and that the Earth may be the only planet in the entire galaxy that has life on it, which was an asinine statement, and yet it was commonly put forward by top scientists. That, of course, has been completely destroyed. And now the basic astro astronomy and cosmology has now shown that the number of planets in this galaxy alone that could have life is in the billions. And so under the truth embargo, some scientists would say, yeah, life is rare. And the government go, yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. Life is rare. Life is rare. So that all that evidence about ETs and stuff must be nonsense. And now the government is faced with scientists saying, no, there's billions of these planets. The truth embargo, Kevin, is on its last legs. It's about to fall apart. And the well, only me, thing that me, I'm concerned about you, is will it fall apart soon enough? Let me interrupt you here because I'm going to have to take the last break. I got Absolutely. you wound up, so I'm wound. we'll take the, I'm we'll wound. Take the last break. Uh, <laughs> there'll be more information at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com and look for uh, the uh, website for Stephen's group. We will be back right after this, so please stick around. And as I promised earlier, I am back with Stephen, Stephen Bassett of the Paradigm Research Organization. Uh, you can take a look at his website at paradigmresearchgroup.org for more information uh, about it. Look up Stephen Bassett on the uh, internet and you can get to it as well. We had been talking a little bit about evidence for the extraterrestrial visitation and the overwhelming nature of it. But we were also talking earlier about these documents from MJ-12 that both Steve and I seem to believe that are a hoax that has really nothing to do with government disinformation, although the timing is somewhat in interesting about it. Um, the documents were put up on the web by Heather Wade and uh, in 
from what she said and the discussions that I've had with her or the email I've had with her, it seems that um, she knows who she got them from, obviously, unlike the first MJ-12 documents where they didn't know where they came from, but she knows who sent them to her and she knows the name of the man who apparently obtained them originally. Um, she's not sharing those names with us and I can't really object to that knowing how some people in the UFO research community react when they learn something like that. Bill Brazel told me that uh, he would often get um, phone calls from drunks in bars at two and three o'clock in the morning asking if the stuff about Roswell was true. And I mean, you want to provide the information so everybody can verify it for themselves. But when you do what you put some of the witnesses who only um, crime, if you will, was to be involved in some kind of a UFO sighting. I, uh, and it, it always sort of struck me that Bill Browser was still a little bit annoyed about the people calling him in the middle of the night to find out if what he had said was true. And he would say, yes, it, it's, it's exactly what I experienced. So we've got Heather Wade. She's got the documents. We've looked at the documents. I think it's pretty clear that they're not authentic in the in, in the form that they don't talk about the event as it really happened. Um, but you had some other, other, uh, I guess, thoughts about this as well. Yeah, there's a larger picture here that has to be considered. Um, so let's again get back to the framing of this. Uh, Heather Wade is a journalist, and she has a program, an information program, uh, which is um, Midnight in the Desert, which is connected to our belt goes way back into the 90s and has played a significant role in uh, bringing information out about the ET issue and providing a platform for researchers and activists and so forth. So it's, it's not a trivial program. One of, one of her uh, listeners, who she has known for two years, provides this document to her, sends it electronically. He claims to be in the military or having been in the military. She feels that he has. I don't know what evidence she has for that, but whatever she feels he has. The document supposedly did not come from him, but was provided to him by a friend who was also in the military. And this friend uh, apparently claimed to have taken it, meaning I took it, right? Stolen okay. it. Stolen it. Stolen in a sense. Okay. So now the document is – uh, not a legitimate, or I say legitimate, it, it's a legitimate hoax, but it is not, in my view, a document that discusses, uh, uh, that, that is a, that was created as part of the government uh, uh, involvement in this issue uh, for the appropriate uh, reasons that you would do that. Uh, and therefore, none of the information in it, though some of it does, does match up with the evidence that has been obtained in some of these cases uh, really can be taken with any uh, seriousness. Now, okay, so what she did is somewhat similar to what WikiLeaks has done. WikiLeaks will get uh, information that's provided to them by an inside source, and they put it out raw, all right, because the people have a right to know. Uh, and there's been a lot of this, and so Heather has done that as well. I don't criticize her for that. Um, this document is provided, uh, and it's interesting. It could be important. She put it up to be reviewed. She didn't make any statements about it, but she made it available. And, and, and of course, we've immediately engaged it. A lot of people have, and we're coming to a pretty good assessment of that document. Okay, so far so good. But what Heather needs to do now is she needs to get back with her source, and she needs to ask that source some tough questions. And then she needs to talk to his friend, who's also a source, and ask that person some tough questions and find out what is going on here. Who are they really, if, there's, if, if she doesn't already know? Why did he give that document, right? Did they know that it had serious flaws in it? to the point of being a fairly obvious hoax. Did the friends mistakenly think it was real and took it, right, from actually a government facility where it was, I don't know, being put together or been lying around? Uh, did he take it at all? How much of what she's being told by her sources is real? 
And if it's not, if she's able to determine that, then she needs to tell us that. Now, whether she chooses to uh, reveal the names of these individuals who have come forward in this fashion, uh, that's kind of ultimately up to her. Uh, but let's be clear, this idea that they're at risk from the government from putting this out, I think is virtually next to zero because this isn't a government super classified document at all and they've not violated any laws whatsoever. And the reason I'm saying this is not to be hard on Heather, uh, but rather to try to, to get out the message that folks, we're in a much more sophisticated time now. And if you wanna screw around with an issue of this importance, that, then you have to be prepared for a blowback. You may have to be prepared to defend yourself. And I'm not referring to Heather here. I'm really referring to the sources. If you can't do it publicly or if you're able to screen yourself, then you, you're going to have to defend yourself to the person that does know who you are. And Heather has uh, a, a need to do this. She has an integrity as a journalist to consider. Uh, and she needs to be some, vigilant here. And I'm not, again, saying she must divulge who these people are. Uh, but she needs to get much more information about who they are to the extent that they'll provide it and ultimately give us opinion as to whether she's been taken for a ride, whether this was an honest mistake or what have you. And the ultimate message is to everybody else. Look, this is not a trivial matter, right? Putting out false information about something like this is like putting false information out about the war in the Middle East, right? Uh, there are consequences. And uh, there are people's lives who have been devoted to this time and effort. And there are people that are dealing with extraterrestrials as contactees. This is a serious matter. Don't screw around with it because we're not going to let it pass. Those days are over, right? We have too many well, resources, think, too much information. I think the one thing we need to point out here is Heather did the right thing by putting it up for us all to look at. I agree. Uh, she might not have had the expertise to... Uh, examine it to the level that we can because of our years of research in the Roswell case or into UFOs and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, going to Stan Friedman, going to Richard Dolan, coming to me, that, that makes perfect sense because we could look at this document in the context of what we know about these various cases and how these things work. Um, and, and as I pointed out, one of the dates on here is 1989, and at that point in time, I had a top secret clearance, so I understood how these things sort of worked at the time and, and how uh, the markings on this even are incorrect. Uh, that sort of thing comes out. Uh, you can look up uh, top secret ultra on the internet and realize exactly what it is, and it's inappropriate for here, and that sort of thing. And I'm, you know, I'm looking at, at Heather as not having that expertise, but she does the thing that is correct, and she did the thing that they didn't do with the Roswell slides. She put it up for everybody to look at. The Roswell slides, they hung on to it, and they yeah. carefully, well, they carefully, they went to various people to get their expert opinions, and some of the expert opinions actually proved prove the case. The, the, the slide mount was correct for the time period. The chemical analysis was right for the time period. It's just yeah. what is the image on that? And we were able to, to determine that once the images were out almost immediately. And she put the thing up on the internet. And I, I don't know how long it was up before um, you called me to talk about it. Not long. Um, Not long. But I was going to say it was probably a matter of an hour if, if that long. And I looked at it, and my first reaction was, as I, as I scanned it quickly, was to pick out some of the problems. But as I went back and read through it carefully, I could find more and more of those problems until it became obvious this is, this is a hoax. I mean, when you look at a, a document created at this level, you're, you're looking at it for the first time, and there may be a typographical error in it because you know this is back in the, the, the era of sure. typewriters. Uh, you, can, sure. you can you can you can or they get the name of a base wrong. I mean that that kind of minutia is important to the people assigned to the base, uh, to the military, and to many of us researchers. But somebody you say, well, it's uh, the Roswell Army uh, Air Force Base. Well, it's really the Roswell Army Airfield. But who's going to understand the difference between a base of and course. a field? You know that sure. sort of thing. Absolutely. So you can understand those things kind of maybe slipping through. But when you began to pile it on in the aggregate. You say, well, this is way too much. Somebody should have corrected all these errors, not just the singular, but all these errors. So I think that she did the right thing in putting it out as quickly as she could and say, what do you guys think? 
and then uh, encouraging discussion about about it as well. That's the proper way to handle something like this so that, that we in the community can say, you know, don't take this any further because this is a hoax. We know it's a hoax. It's interesting, I guess, in, in, in one sense, but it is a hoax. And let's move on to the next thing where we've got better evidence and, and uh, we have better witnesses and we, we have a provenance for the document, which we don't really mm -hmm. have for this. Again, I think this is a win-win. Uh, she was a journalist. This yes. is a very uh, interesting subject. People are very interested in it. She got a document. The, the source said, you know, this is something from the government. Uh, okay, fine. And so she puts it up. She didn't make assertions about it. She didn't say, oh, boy, this is it. No, she simply put it up. And, uh, and we had an opportunity to do our thing and demonstrate to uh, the general public that uh, we – do care about the validity of any information related to the ET subject. We have the skills to examine this stuff, and uh, that's good too. Uh, so uh, no problem there, but I, I do believe that she has a responsibility to challenge her sources and learn what she can and provide that, maybe short of giving us the names uh, uh, essentially, so that we can move forward. Uh, especially because we have now determined that the document is fraudulent. Now we need yeah. to know more about we need to more about that and, and sort of I guess inhibit this from happening again. Look, if the document had been given to her by a source that said, "Look, I have an example of a disinformation document that the government had worked on or something, and I, they never it never went out, but I've got it, and and I'm going to put it out so you can kind of see the kind of stuff they do." That's a whole different ballgame. But yes, uh, but the other thing is this: look, uh, tomorrow or a week from now, our government could put out a disinformation piece, um, something at the quality of the original MJ-12 documents, which was a far, far, far more sophisticated example of disinformation in my view. And uh, it could be – and it would require a significant effort uh, on the part of researchers to uh, ascertain exactly what they have there. Uh, and uh, great. We're just letting them know, yeah, we can do that. Um, and uh, so, you know, if you want to do it, give it a shot. But it's probably not going to work very well. And, and I want the people to know that. I want the journalists to know that. All right. Uh, and let, me, let me tell you something. I've dealt with a lot of journalists, OK? They screw up all the time. And when you look at some of the work that's been done by the researchers in the extraterrestrial phenomena field, particularly when it comes to some of the more complex cases, the work that they've done is superior to some of the best journalists in the country. And so I, again, know the flaws uh, of the citizen science activist effort, but I actually have a pretty high opinion of it. And, and, I, and, I, and I will repeat that it is the, the investigative journalists, the professionals who supposedly have all this uh, background and training and everything that have failed us because with all the resources they have at the Washington Post and the New York Times and the major networks, they have not engaged this story properly. They have not challenged the government. They haven't figured it out. And if they know, they won't tell us. And so there is a failure that needs to be addressed. Well, I think I think one of the problems is, and, and it comes to, to fruition, is that the some of the mainstream journalists do not want to be thrown uh, uh, under the ridicule curtain. Oh, you don't believe in those flying saucers, do you? Yeah. When Don and I were promoting the um, UFO crash at Roswell, we were went to the Chicago Tribune because we had an in, we did a scheduled interview for them. Uh, they met us in the hallway, didn't bother taking us inside to in any office, and it was an intern who did the interview. Give you an idea of the level of importance they saw this story. It was just one of those throwaway stories. The other thing is a number of years ago, a couple of New Jersey guys wanted to prove how credulous UFO researchers were, and they were launching hot air balloons with flares on them and then attempting to get people to, to report on it. Well, you, you had a number of reports made of the lights drifting through the sky and that sort of thing. But what struck me is when you looked at the witness testimony, what the witnesses were saying, they were describing exactly what they'd seen. They weren't putting an interpretation on it. They weren't saying it was an alien spacecraft. They were saying, we saw these lights. They did this. And at one point, you see the uh, – it seemed like the lights were blinking. And the journalist pointed that out, and the, and the woman, the witness, said, oh, no, that's it going behind the trees. So she understood what, why the lights were flashing. 
Yeah. Um, and the guys then to make the story better uh, called the newspaper or called the, the TV station and said, well, it came down close to our car and we saw it right up close and that sort of thing. But they were injecting themselves into the experiment. And what, what really struck me about this was the witnesses described exactly what they seen without the interpretation. The UFO investigators, uh, Mark D'Antonio being one of them, knew immediately what it was and said so. One of the police officers involved said, well, it's either uh, Chinese lanterns or it's a flare on a balloon. It was explained, but the news media was busy interviewing people and talking, asking, well, what do you think about alien life? And they, sure. they, found, they found some little girl with a lollipop. And so what do you think about the aliens visiting New Jersey? And I'm thinking, yeah. uh, nobody said a word about aliens. That you injecting your opinion into the story and kind of ridiculing it. Making Look, it uh, I've said many times, Kevin, this truth embargo one way or another makes fools of us all. And that includes the media, the military, the White House, the private citizens. Let me give you another story. Um, in 2010, a press conference was put together by Robert Salas, uh, Robert Robert Salas and uh, yes. Robert Hastings, and this was the um, uh, what we call like uh, dealing with the issue of nuclear weapons tampering um, by unknown craft, and uh, five uh, SAC base officers uh, who had been interviewed by Hastings for part of his book UFOs and Nukes came in under their own dime and put on a press conference at the National Press Club. I was there and quite a few press attended. Uh, and so you have these five SAC base officers, all captains, or at least I think all, most of them are captain, one might have been a sergeant, testifying to multiple instances where a, where a quote, craft comes down, hovers directly over their SAC base and all of the missiles shut down. Uh, more than one instance. And there have actually been quite a few. And these, these men all had security clearance is sufficient to allow them to to be working our SAC base facilities, our missile launch facilities, including Robert Salas, who was the missile launch commander at the time at that facility. These are the people that under the correct instructions would launch nuclear weapons that would end human civilization. And so there they are uh, testifying to this uh, these circumstances, even if they can't say definitively it was extraterrestrial. The event itself should should warrant a massive in congressional investigation and huge investigations by major newspapers. Very little was written about it, a few articles. And there and but the the point I want to make is the famous cookie article that was written by the Washington Post representative at this press conference. The Washington Post, the political paper of record in the United States, and this is 2010, sent only one of their, well, actually it was a Metro editor by the name of Kelly, and he then writes up his account of this press conference in the Washington Post the next day, where he makes fun of the press conference with heavy emphasis on the cookies that were being served to the journalist during the break. Now, that's a journalistic failure of monumental proportions. That's not a mis that's not a misinterpretation. That is that's outright complete incompetence. Let's be clear. Well, let's, 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 Nobody let's, wants to be let, let me just finish, let me just yes. finish this. Thing. Nobody wants to be ridiculed. The, uh, and, and, and I understand trying to avoid that. And no one wants to be thrown under the ridicule bus. But when the government is driving that bus, that is absolutely unacceptable. But there's another problem with this, and that's national Always. security. That's national security. Uh, yeah. This this really is national uh, security because if an outside force, regardless of that force, whether it's extraterrestrial or at the time the Soviet Union or anybody else can can deactivate the missiles, that is a matter of national of security. Course. And that must be – Which is why it, there should be 20 congressional hearings about it. I mean, something I, like that is a congressional hearing matter of the highest order. You know, I, that, and that, that's my point. It doesn't matter what the source And how many was. congressional hearings have there been? How many, you know how many congressional hearings there have been on that subject? Zero. Because and that is, that is a classic case, Kevin, of the dog that didn't bark. OK, you, you want to talk about where the government is on this matter. All right. You have the, the, the it was the uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes um, a case uh, of uh, uh, that was solved because a dog that was supposed to bark didn't bark, solved the case. OK, so you have a situation here where SAC base officers as early as 2000 start coming forward with the accounts of the missile shutdowns at multiple facilities. OK, 
they, they uh, books are written. They're interviewed in some of the alternative press. They even give a press conference at the National Press Club, and the, the U.S. Congress does not hold a single hearing on it. That defies all logic. It defies anything anybody wants to know about the importance of national security, the role of the Congress in, uh, in, in our government. And so the very fact that they don't hold a hearing on it tells you all you need to know about the fact that this thing is massively embargoed. They cannot touch it. They cannot deal with it. All right. And that plays directly into the other evidence, which is the reason they can't deal with it is that it is a matter of huge national security implications that they have chosen to lie about intentionally and they can't get out of that lie. And there are many, many other dogs that have not barked over these years. And I pay a lot of attention to those. And unless some reporter can come forward and give me or a member of Congress, a clear and rational understanding why the Congress and the press are not massively on that subject, then their entire position on this is fraudulent. Well, I think that you know, looking at all of that sort of thing, it, the important point is it was a matter of national security. And, and the other thing is that when you look at the uh, sightings at um, Belt, Montana in 1967, which is the ones that Solace was involved with, um, you have the Condon Committee doing their investigation at the time. Oh, we're running out of time here. Condon Committee doing the time, and they went to investigate those sightings around there, and the UFO officer at the base told him at certain points, I can't talk to you about this because it's a matter of national security. So the national security bug does exist in these in the UFO sightings, but it's not necessarily the UFO sighting that, that was responsible for it, but the outside influence on the missile silos that was the important point. But you're right, it should should have been well, covered. Yeah, it, it should have been covered yeah. and it should have been covered extensively and leave the UFO out of it. If something can influence the missiles, that's something we need to know. And so that we can we can look, correct if, if, it and fix it. If, if a congressional investigation or an investigation by the uh, the Pentagon can explain all of the missile tampering incidents that have taken place, then great. But they don't even bother to do that, and that is that is of course the tell. That's the problem. Uh, it, it, and but this is not the only instance of that. There are all kinds of incidents like this. Look, the, the fifty percent of the people. Yeah, Steve, we're, we're done. We're out, of, we're out of time. We're out of time. <laughs> okay. It's been an enjoyable conversation. I know I've got you worked up a couple of times, which is my job, I think. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> you know, uh, your website is uh, paradigmresearchgroup.org. You can look up Stephen Bassett on the internet and uh, uh, get to his uh, website and uh, sign up for his newsletter, sign up for his uh, uh information. You can find him speaking all over the world <laughs> at various times. So he goes uh, around to a lot of different places. I will be back with um, my guest next week, Irina Scott, talking about uh, UFOs uh, from the beginning, I guess. You can take a look at my blog at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. We'll have a link to the uh, the interviews here and other interviews as well, and more information about these, uh, these documents that we've been talking about somewhat uh, today. Uh, for a longer analysis of the MJ-12 document, you can take a look at my book, Roswell in the 21st Century. I have a, a 50 or 60 page uh, comment in there with some 175 footnotes, so it's documented about what it had to say. So you can take a look at all of that sort of thing to gather more information about what we've been talking about here today and what we're uh, going to talk about in the near future. Uh, Steve, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you uh, missing your lunch hour for this we will be back uh, we will be back uh, 